Good morning, Mr. Bard. Good morning, Mr. Robson. Thanks so much for joining us today. We're going to have a little chat about the future of men's work today. Great. Could yeah. it be more important? <laughs> exactly, yeah. So, yeah, it was quite some years ago that you and I had our first um, little, what we called it, a men's research weekend up at the Node in Stockholm, right? Where we invited together with uh, Booster Rodvik. Uh, he was the professional dancer, you were the philosopher, and I was the guy who was kind of a little bit between the mind-body uh, things. And we, and we had, what, was it 35 guys up there? Something yeah, like that. that's yeah. correct. Yeah. Something like that. That was a few years back. So quite a lot has happened since. And, and uh, most important that we have connected with a lot of other guys out there, especially around Europe, who do similar work. And some of them were pioneers long before we got started. Mm -hmm. And what's great with Manifesto as a decentralized network is the fact that we now deeply respect each other. And we're trying to find what I would call best practice when it comes to men's work. So anybody who comes up with a great idea that seems to work when it comes to, you know, getting men connected with each other and taking responsibility for each other. And anybody comes up with an idea that seems to work can then be applied by everybody else as well, which is great. It's a great way of working. Yeah, it really seems like uh, since we, I remember back then, then when I said the word men's work to people, then they'd be like, what, what's that? That sounds weird or something like that. And it seems like, you know, I've just been in the Czech Republic to a big gathering with over 100 guys there. How many were down in Berlin? Was there 400, 500 guys at Men's Sign? In yeah, 500 guys at the Men's Sign Conference too. Yeah, that's yeah. correct. Yeah. yeah so really I think it's important to make a distinction here between men's work and men's rights. Um, it, not that we're against men's rights or women's rights for that matter, but I think the men's rights movement that came out of North America has a better, very bitter tone to it. And it, it starts from a sort of a self-victimization perspective. And that's what we're totally against. So we believe in the heroic. We believe that men can step up and be heroic. We certainly believe that women can step up and be heroic too. Mm -hmm. And so this is all about finding strength in each other and finding support through strength. And, and this whole movement that we call the men's work movement today is basically to make it different from other parts of the men's movement that are more into the sort of bitter uh, victimhood mentality, uh, which is what the men's right movement has turned out to be in North America. And we, we're not part of that at all. What we're talking about here is men working with themselves and working with other men in, in, in mutual support. Yeah. That's what we're doing. Yeah, it's, it's not like there aren't relevant issues where, where men are struggling today and where men sometimes get a bad deal. But what we just found really is that when you focus on rights, then you automatically write yourself into this kind of victimhood paradigm, right? Where, where you're looking at like, oh, me, I'm a poor victim of the circumstances that I'm in. Oh, I just lost the cable over here. <laughs> um, and, uh, and, and yeah, that's where we see that the chain kind of falls off, right? So, so, so maybe, yeah, do you want to try from your perspective to say what it is that you're doing in the men's work paradigm and, and what you see, how, how things are shaping up? Uh, what, what, what is the perspective you're Well, when it, when it comes to human rights to begin there, uh, it, it, it's, it's all equal. Like we're talking about citizens' rights and human rights. They're equal for men and women. And it's better actually to find support among women to share your perspective when you want to fight for those rights. For example, it can be a divorce settlement, which really is about children's rights more than anything else. And children's rights have access both to a father and a mother and, and to parents and, and grown-ups in general. And, and that rights struggle is better solved with men and women collaborating with each other. We're talking about here, we talk about men's work, is that we do live in a society where we've actually been experimenting for the past, say, 50 years on a massive scale in the West, throwing men and women together all the time meaning we've ended up with a kind of what I call the sort of low key, but gradually growing sexual stress. And this sexual stress comes from the fact that we believe these days in our society that we should throw women and men together at all times in all environments. So we try to even through political maneuvers, we try to force more women into uh, places where they're mostly men. And we've tried to force more men into places where they're mostly women, not even looking into the fact that there could be difference between the genders and that men could be more comfortable with certain things and women more comfortable with other things. And men could even, as populations, be better at certain things and women could be better at certain things as populations. And so instead of waiting for and, and, and giving people the freedom to choose for themselves and then see patterns where men can really excel at what they do and women can excel at what they do, we basically come up with this idea that we're gonna force people 
force men and women together all the time in all environments. And, and we've done this with an ideology. We blame everything in society, all our different shortcomings on something we call patriarchy. I think that's a major mistake. Number one, patriarchy is a beautiful word. And the word literally means that this is how older men guide the younger men in a society. So this is how younger men in society look up to the older men and to their wisdom and to their life experience to be guided by them. Matriarchy is also a beautiful word and should also be used. And matriarchy is essentially how younger women look up to older women for wisdom and guidance in their lives. So we go to our own gender when we try to find guidance in our life because obviously a man better understands another man than a woman would ever do. And a woman better understands another woman than a man would ever do. So when you go to your own gender, you do precisely to find identification with somebody, somebody you share path, paths with. And usually when somebody's older than you from your own gender, that's the best possible guide you could have. So we have a need as human beings to go inside our own gender and find somebody there for support. And, and this is what patriarchy and matriarchy really are. So the best way to use these two words is to always use them in the same sentences and basically explain these are beautiful words that we need to recapture. So what was the problem then with, with, with the, you know, the society of sexual stress? Well, if you force men and women to be, be together 24 hours a day, essentially, um, you create stress because you essentially create a society which is like a bar on a Friday night where everybody gets drunk constantly. So um, this means, for example, the women are under stress because they feel they have to look sexually attractive all the time. Men are under stress because they also feel they have to look sexually attractive all the time. And we all know what it's like to have a guy around who suddenly behaves in a very sort of immature way just because women have entered the room. Mm -hmm. And he has, has to try to impress them and get recognition from them. And for example, you and I are very in interested right now in Orthodox Christianity. And I, I spent some time with a friend in Mount Athos in Greece recently, and we took a week off and started trekking on this place, which has a population of about 10,000 men and zero women. Mm -hmm. And the first thing you serve is that the place is really calm. Mm -hmm. It isn't calm because the women are gone. It's calm because men behave differently when women are not around. That's why it's so calm. And that's why it's wonderful to be there. And I can certainly think that a lot of women would prefer to spend more time with other women, not having men around all the time because it causes less sexual stress. So I think this is, this is a good foundation to build a modern men's work movement from, just like there's probably going to be a, a matching women's work movement. And, and this means that it could be nice just for a while, you know, to, to be only with men around if you're a man, um, you feel much more comfortable that way. You can go much deeper inside yourself. You can go more spiritual and you can deal with shit in your life and sort things out and come out of the whole experience stronger and more powerful. That's yeah, what doesn't mean. take away from, from men talking to women at the same time as well, right? We're not advocating that suddenly, no. oh, we should never discuss with and try and understand women better as men or women, but, but, but just that because we're in the society of being separated or together so much of the time, what, what yeah. the effect of just having that weekend that we've had sometimes now or four days, group of guys a little bit outside of the city, uh, just being together with men and focusing on that. Uh, uh, yeah, definitely that calmness, that sense of kind of confidence and, and relaxation uh, that guys experience uh, seems to be magical as well. Exactly. That, that calmness and that relaxation is the first thing I experience when I go to a men's event. And I'm sure women feel the same way. So uh, separating the two genders occasionally could actually be a really good idea. You know, I grew up in a working class town in, in central Sweden. Uh, and when I was a kid, we would go to the bathhouse on certain nights every week. And there were only the men there. They didn't need, didn't need to wear swim trunks. They were all naked. And it was all very comfortable and very relaxed. And then the women had their nights. And I actually think that was a really good idea, you know, because in a modern contemporary bathhouse, you have the women and the men and the kids there all the time. And there's a lot of stress and a lot of noise and you can't really relax in that environment. Mm -hmm. So um, th there's a lot of good ideas coming out of this sort of this retrieval of the separate gender uh, environment. Uh, and, and let's make the best out of it. And let's emphasize that we're building all of this from a position where we do believe in radical equality between the genders. Equality when it comes to rights, also equalities when it comes to duties and responsibilities. We believe women are strong and they can share power and they can share responsibility to society with us as men. And that's the foundation. 
Uh, we even firmly believe, I would say, that the original tribe was a very equal environment where women and men were equally respected. We then had a sort of male-dominated historical period, which was first built on large-scale farming and later on large-scale manufacturing, where because of men's advantage when it comes to physical power, more men were out there working and making the money, and women did not benefit from that system. Women are not caught up with that in, in a contemporary society where information and communication and product leadership and caring are huge industries these days where women excel. Women now are on a par with men in almost every, every measurement you can make. And when you say that we you return. Women, sorry, can I just ask, when you say you don't think women benefited from that society, um, do you think that that means that that's the same as saying that women were oppressed or you know, so sometimes I think like, you know, it seems like a world of women, like a lot of other factors are affecting. And I, I meet a lot of women who prefer to have a more relaxed life where they're not so pressured and stressed uh, as... Oh, have. sure. Oh, sure. Uh, there, there are also individual men who love to have a dominatrix walk along all day long. You know, so that we will always find people who are perfectly happy with systems where somebody else dominates and they can benefit from that in many ways. But on a par, if, if, if you look at the population as a whole, I'm sure the vast majority of modern women today in countries like Sweden and Denmark, where you and I live, would agree that after the 1945, women took on a lot more jobs, started making their own money, could make their own decisions over their own lives and regardless of, of how you feel towards the pill or abortion or whatever but we did develop technologies also where women control their own bodies and and you know decide for themselves when in their lives they wanted to give birth to children and mm -hmm. how they wanted to arrange their families and things like that and i think we need to be in dialogue with women and recognize this made women more powerful when it came to having direct access to resources so when a woman had to go you know, home and, and her, her husband made all the money, then that was only an indirect access to resources. And, and women are, for good reasons, pretty obsessed with resources. They like shopping, right? The reason for that is that women are going to give birth to children. And, and to give birth to a child, you better make sure you, you have permanent access to resources way beyond your own needs when you give birth to a child. So it's, it's a, a very intelligent biological reaction for women to start looking for provision, and protection before they do something as committed as giving birth to a child and, and going into a family situation. So I think we're yeah. going to just listen to women in this department and find out that they did benefit in the sense that they have direct access to their own resources. And frankly, when they couldn't trust men the way they could have before, and when men became less trustworthy, it became more important for women to have even more direct access to resources. And that's why we created the welfare state. And we can now look at that, look back at that and say that, if we can now so, sort of uh, take, uh, be, become less dependent on the welfare state while also making all adults in our society having a direct access to resources so they can live a meaningful life, that would be a good thing for all. Then we can look back to history and we can also learn from history and find relationships between men and women where they're mutually respectful of each other and they're treated as equal before the law. So, um, and I think, I think we, we can reach that. I don't think that's even hard. I think that's pretty easy to do. What we then have to look to is our own direct spiritual needs. When it comes to our own direct spiritual needs, for me as a man to be able to have great, fruitful, productive, creative relationships with women, I need to be a strong man. And I need that strength and that recognition from other men, not from women. Uh, one, of, one of the things we discovered, you and I, we started doing men's work was that, especially Scandinavian men, were often looking for recognition from women. And we told them right away, that's the wrong place to look. You know, <laughs> women are people you're supposed to deliver to. Your recognition is something you get from other men. Your recognition as a grown up adult man is something you get from other men. So you need to work on your brotherhood. And I've, I've really gone through a journey over the last few years that I've discovered that a lot of modern men are looking to women to solve their problems instead of looking to themselves and their own gender. And no, just very, very women common. To feel like they're okay, right? Like, like, please confirm me, tell me that I'm okay, that I can relax oh, about no. myself instead of like, okay, getting that. But women hate that to begin with, which is a clear sign that something is fundamentally wrong, right? Yeah, so, so uh, yeah, you, you don't ask a woman for recognition. You don't. You ask her how you can deliver to her, and you present your own plan for your own life, first of all. Just like, this is the kind of man I am. This is my archetype, my personality. This is how I contribute to the collective of other men. This is what other men find in me. And this is where I'm going to go in my life. And then you can always ask the right woman, do you want to follow me? Do you want to go with me? 
Do you want to why, join? Why do you think that that's a, that's such a, a risk to be like that pleaser type of guy? Can you try explain a little bit more, maybe? Why it is oh, that? it's it's a fucked up society, really a fucked up society to begin with. And I often start with a man's own relationship with his own mother and women in general when he grew up. And the overbearing mother or the absent mother can both be problematic. But the, the, the lack of, of a presence of, of a proper mother in his life uh, often makes him into this guy who can then go into even sex addictions and all kinds of things. But he has pretty fucked up relationships with women in general. Go back to your relationship with your own mother and try to make that work. Before you even do that, though, go back to your relationship with your own father and make sure that works. And, you know... They were just human, your parents, but you have to forgive your parents and you have to acknowledge them and you have to respect them. You have to respect your own limits before you can start working with other people and, yes. and support others in, on their spiritual journey. So you have to fix your relationship with your own mom and your own dad to begin with. And if your mom and your dad weren't there, then you have to find other people to replace them with. I always talk about fathers in pluralists. That means that if your father wasn't there, uh, maybe number one, you got the wrong impression of what a father should be and you're mistaking it for what, what a mother should be. So try to find out what a father really is. What is the idea of the father? So you have the right expectations on your dad. But then also other men, mentors, uncles and godfathers and, you know, your boss possibly, but other men around you that you had when you grew up can replace your father in so many different departments. So when you think of fathers and pluralists, you can solve that issue. Then you can go to your relationship to your mother, which is more singular. Because if you haven't fixed your relationship to your mother, you will have a pretty fucked up relationship with women in general. And this is what we try to sort out when we do men's work. These are the first things we sort out. Yeah, maybe just on the father. So the, 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 a, a very big narrative that I hear a lot of places and a lot of the, some of the first men's work courses or retreats that I've been on, uh, a lot of it was about the absent father and a lot of men complaining about how their fathers weren't there early on in their childhood. Um, and I know that you have some opinions on, on how that can sometimes be taken too far um, or... Oh, yeah. A lot of these guys that I, when I sit down and talk to them, they have a very effeminate idea of who their father should be. Or should have been. And that's not correct. That, that's actually looking in the wrong place. It's like I always say that, you know, if you only try to look in the light in a room and you don't look in the dark of the room, you're going to find the wrong answer, right? Yeah. So you might, you have to look somewhere else than your lack of motherhood when you grow up and lack of a mother being present when you're going to look for your father. Yeah, and it seems like a lot of guys have a, an idea of their father being mother number two, who's also kind of providing yes. traditional yeah. love instead of being that role model who's out you know, conquering the world and doing something important yeah. and contributing to society and taking responsibility to be able to provide uh, for the family, right? So. Yeah, exactly. So, so, so they say that the father wasn't present. He wasn't there all the time. Well, wait a second. If both your parents were supposed to be there all the time, you're not talking about a family. You're talking about a daycare center, right? <laughs> and a family is not a daycare center. And, and fundamentally, this, this can, of course, individually be different. There, there are fathers who stay with the kids and mothers who go out in the world and work hard, and they're very conscious of it, and they can then make an exception from the rule. But in general, the mother is very present to us because we are born out of her body and her tit, the mamilla, as it's called in psychoanalysis, the mamilla is what we trust the first year of our life. So the, the enormous strong presence of the female body, of the mother's body, is fundamental to us, both to boys and to girls, right? But after one year of age, suddenly the father's body or the body of the fathers becomes much more important to us in our imagination. And then the father starts representing the grown-ups before the mother does. Because the mother is still this nurturing figure is always there for us in a fundamental sense. But that also means the mother is also tied to the narrative of the fairy tale. Like you can have anything you want at any time or you You're can be anything. The universe. <laughs> yeah, you can be the center of the universe. You can be a narcissist, right? You can be anything you want. That story is the story we do get from the female body, from the mother's body. And for example, in Christianity, it's beautifully portrayed by the Virgin and the Jesus child. That's why that picture is even more common than even Christ on the cross. It's the most common picture you find in Christianity. And it's present in all religions, constantly this idea of the, the mother who takes care of the child no matter what. But that's only half the story, because the mother cannot sit there and take care of the child all the time unless somebody else provides for her to be able to do that. And that is where the fatherly figure comes into the fantasy of the child. Mm -hmm. 
And this is called the phallic intrusion. And this is where psychologists and psychiatrists and psychoanalysts actually all agree, no matter how you look at the human mind, something incredibly important happens around the age of one. And that's when the phallic intrusion happens. The father's body and the penis and everything we associate with the father's body comes into the imagination of the boy or the girl. And you start imagining that you can one day become a grown-up. Then you start looking at the mother's body differently. Then you think that the mother's body is sexually attractive to the father. So that the mother's body that you came out of, they provided everything for you. They give birth to you where you spent the first nine months of your life inside of it in a damn morphine tent without a single problem. You didn't even have to think. That's all you have to think for yourself because the, way, the year you spent at the Mamilla believing you were still connected with the world and you still weren't living in isolation on your own suddenly breaks up instantly and, and you realize you are your own being. You're separated from the mother's body through the perception of the father's presence. And then you discover, this is Sigmund Freud's great insight, then you discover that the father finds the mother sexually attractive. And you cannot compete with that. You cannot compete with the father's bodily attraction. You cannot compete with the mother's bodily attraction. You're not a sexual being. So sexuality becomes something incredibly mysterious, a game that the grown-ups play, right? And from the year of about one, until your teenage years and finally your you know your body changes and suddenly your dick's there and your pussy's there and your tits are there and suddenly you start having sexual imaginations you start to finally realize what all the grown-ups were up to but you've been growing towards that that's the really functioning really good childhood is about this journey from about one year of age up until your teenage years and finally goes into rite of passage where the community recognizes that you are now a fully grown up man or a woman and you're ready to take responsibility for yourself. Yeah, so one so of the most powerful- the father, is, the father is absent. In, in a certain sense, the father is always absent. Yeah. He's not absent in an absent sense. He's present in an absent sense, meaning he will be there for us when we need him. He will step into our lives. He will return from his journeys. He will return from the outer circuit into the inner circuit. We will find him at night, certainly next to our mothers and next to other women. So, uh, but then he has to go out in the world again the next day to fulfill his mission in life. And it's precisely by not being present that we can fantasize about him and about the grown-ups. Yeah. So, so what, what I was about, just to come back to the, the, your, the first Nordic men's gathering that we had two years ago, then the, I remember, I'm sure you remember the first... Uh, evening, then we did this recognizing your father lineage ritual, right? Which the Czech guys come and did for us. And I still often have men mentioning to me like, wow, that's one of the most powerful things that I've done of seeing in, a, in an embodied sense as well, feeling and experiencing how I'm a product of my father and his father before him and his father before him and how they have each been survivors. And yes, you know, I've had a tough time with my father and there's been difficulties and challenges and he wasn't a perfect man, but, but he's created everything that I am and everything that's good in my life today, I have to thank for, for my father and their fathers. And, and they've been doing the best that they could. Um, so, so maybe- Yeah, a, I, I, I would even say, we can use, we can use Christianity here uh, and say that father, son, and spirit as a trinity are part of this lineage because according to Freud, the Ur father is the original God. Religion really starts with our relationships to the history and to the future. So history and future here are very often represented by female and male bodies. And, and that means the patriarch leads the tribe and the matriarch walks at the very end of the tribe. So you have to be in front of her to survive, to be nomadic. That means women are caring. Women push you in front of you. Women will always, a great female leader will walk into the room and say, has everybody in the room been seen and heard? Have you had access to all the knowledge we have in this room so we can be really intelligent and wise together? That's strong female leadership. And the matriarchal leadership in, in the tribe is often somebody pushing you in front of her. Mm -hmm. uh, so you better be in front of her to survive, right? But the patriarchy has to be there to lead us into the future. And that means we associate the Ur father and the Ur mother, the original god and the original goddess, we associate them with lineage. So we associate whatever is behind the matriarch, that's the Ur mother. That's the mother of all mothers. And what we associate with being ahead of the patriarch is the father of all fathers. And this is the beginning of religion, the beauty of religion. So father, son, and spirit here is more like your own father could be the son. The father of all the fathers, including your father, is the father. 
that's the father aspect of, of divinity. And the spirit is what you're supposed to, to achieve in your life. That's why the Holy Spirit in Christianity is so associated with the community. Meaning that when Jesus says that when I've left, meaning when the father has died and left, wherever you guys are together, I will be there with you. And that is the, the emphasis on the Holy Spirit. So there's a, there's, a, there's a beautiful idea behind the Trinity, regardless of whether you're Christian or not, but you can use this vocabulary to try to understand what lineage is to men. So there's Father, there's Son, and there's Spirit. There's also another aspect of which we should emphasize. And the separation of Father and Son in Christianity is similar to something that we constantly return to when we study patriarchy. And patriarchy has to have two different leaders. One leader is the chieftain, and the other leader is the priest and they may not be the same person. And the reason for that is that because you're gonna lead, because you're gonna fulfill the vision, somebody has to draw the map of where we're gonna go. That's the priestly call. That takes one set of talents, that's one archetype. The other one has to physically actually lead us, and that's the chieftain. So you could call the king and priest or whatever you like, but you always separate these two. And when you think about it thoroughly, you realize that whenever we project everything we expect, onto one man, an older man, we get the tyrant. Okay. And all the tragedies of human history has been when we put a tyrant in charge of things. So, so that's exactly why Christianity separates father and son, because it's important for us in our imagination that we separate these two different aspects of what it means to be a man. The way we literally do it, you and I, in our work, in men's work, is of course that we tell the guys that they have two dicks, right? It's very, it's very direct. So you've got a dick between your leg, you've got a dick in your head. So, so if you haven't worked on the dick in your head, but you believe in the dick between your legs, you believe in your physical body, you have physical self-confidence, you, you go to the gym, you, you're a good lover to women, whatever, right? Okay, if you have physical self-confidence, you need to work on your mental self-confidence. So you get a dick in your head too. But a lot of guys out there these days are also very nerdy, and they certainly believe they got a dick in their head and they're brave and they're courageous and they make tough decisions and they can speak their minds all the time. But, you know, their body more or less stops here at the throat and whenever it's beneath the throat, they don't like that at all and they have problems with it. Then we need to work with them through body work. Then we start working on their body. We tell them, you can't just have a dick in your head. You need a dick between your legs too. But it turns out that this is very direct language, this very direct sort of almost comic strip language that we use with the guys to say, you need a dick in your head, you need a dick between your legs to be a full man. It turns out to be a very good description. It seems to work with just about every guy we work with, which I find interesting. Okay. I haven't tried that metaphor myself yet, but definitely there's something about being able to talk directly to each other in these men's events and, and, and this yeah. combination of... You know, it's not just about reading a book and developing some theories and ideas, uh, but, but really much this embodied practice uh, of, yeah. of combining. And, and that's something that we have a Mind lot work of. Mind work and body work. Yes. Mind work and body Yeah, absolutely. Work. And, and, and the great thing, if you, if you look at the benefits of separating, um, we are mind and we are body. Uh, and, and of course, father and son or, or, or chief, tenant, and priest only become leadership together. There's no leadership with only chieftain. There's no leadership with only the priest. But the, but the benefit we get from separating the two, we think about the two different aspects of the same thing, is that we can also focus on what we should work on. But we can also look at other men as collaborators, which is the beauty of the whole thing. At the end of the day, you need to find your own archetype. And what we mean with that is you need to find what kind of man you're going to be. And you find that precisely but by allowing other men to admire you for your strengths and then allowing yourself to admire them for having things that you don't have. And it's precisely when you discover that another man has a talent that you don't have and you really honor him for it and you allow him to glow so that he can do the same to you. Then we move away from the biggest tragedy of contemporary society and that is men believing they must compete with each other. Competition yeah, and this is, why... is not what we're doing. Collaboration is everything about being in. Yeah, and this is why we need to actually, you know, it's not just about reading a book about something, but we gather together a group of guys and go out into the countryside to have this physical experience of one of the guys I was speaking to, he, he said to me, like, he, it was the first time he came to something like that. And the, he was like, okay, we're like 140 guys here out in the middle of nowhere. There's no woman, there's no beer. And there's these people up on the stage saying like, hey, you know, like, let's try and be nice to each other and help each other and, and actually build each other up. And it was like, oh, yeah, that, well, now that I'm here, that's actually a good idea. And then having that concrete experience of like, wow, that's so fantastic of like creating these connections with other men uh, just is, is, a, 
is an embodied experience. You, you were talking a bit about the Orthodox Church as well, right? And one of the things I've already noticed about the way they do things as well is how in, in the West, we've kind of like cut off the human being, as you were talking about, between the mind and the body and separated those two things. Whereas, whereas the Orthodox mm -hmm. practice, I'm sure you saw it in Mount Athos, where you were like, it's a very physical experience where you really not just like talking about Jesus and the idea of him, but, but you're actually like, you know, Jesus went through sufferings and pain and stuff like that. And, and that's what they actually do with their physical bodies, you know, while also having these, these ideas. Um, yeah, so we are all mind and body, but some, some, of us, some of us are professionally more mind than body, some of us are professionally more body than mind, and that's yeah. only because we contribute differently to the community, but we have to be both mind and body, every one of us, otherwise we're not full human beings, so yes. you need to keep the two separate. One example of this that we've done also is that we recommended a lot of guys to go and do martial arts. Uh, especially the guys that actually should have a physical self-confidence, but they don't have one. So they don't believe in their physiology. And, and, and then they discover when they do martial arts, that it's not about competition. It's not about who's the strongest guy and beats the shit out, out of the other guy. But it's actually, it has rituals, it has rules, it has a referee, it has the coaches. So it's really just a tryout. It's a try between two men on who is the strongest and technically most fit today and who can thereby inspire the other guy to work harder on, on his technicalities. So it is an environment where you actually collaborate as well. You know, basically, if you go to martial arts scholar, those are the two best warriors we have in the entire tribe. And if one of them dies, the other guy is the only best warrior we have left. So we honor them both. That's, that's what going to a martial arts gala is all about. So again, fundamentally between men, the relationships between men are about collaboration, just like you also have to have, not have a competing mind that competes with his own body, but you have to be collaborated to yourself, your own collaboration. We call this a monist worldview, and, and maybe this was the greatest contribution of Eastern religion because they did keep the monist worldview in different versions of it. And the problem we had in the West was that we had a dualism that we inherit, especially with Protestant Christianity and later with Cartesianism, and we have to get out of that. We are not individuals, and we're not individuals at war with each other. And, and I think as men today, we're really sick and tired of being told all the time that we must compete with other men. Even women find it pathetic, you know. A woman who goes to a bar on a Friday night and looking for a man or a boyfriend or whatever, she, she will definitely go for the guy who has the best collaboration with other men. She will look the to the men as a group. respect of the other men, right? You can see yes. like, the guy who has yes. other men who respect him. That's how, she, that's how women have always selected a partner, right? So, so, yeah. I mean, you, you can look great. You can have the looks and you can look successful and drive your sports car or whatever and have your credit cards. But if you're a loner, no, no, the women are not going to go for you. They're not. They're going to go for the guy who has strong connections with other men because he's a guy that she can find support from. And he, she, he's the guy she can trust. He's out there in the world delivering with his brothers. And that's exactly why he becomes attractive to a woman. So all of this makes sense when you have the bigger picture. Now, what I find interesting to men's work for myself, where it becomes a study for me and when I don't have a finished theory at all, is when we start looking at the archetypes. And I think we can pretty much today map the original archetypes. Say you go back five to 10,000 years to the original nomadic tribe. Then you discover that tribe existed for what? 130, 140,000 years at least. So during all that time, our social biology was shaped and we became the different archetypes that were born. But the problem today is that we live in a very different society, different civilization compared to 5,000 years ago. And and this is why, I, honestly, today, when I talk, say, to a 23-year-old guy who comes to our events and he's a bit confused, I have to admit to him that I could probably map his primary archetype, that which he does with ease, but which still impresses other brothers, right? That's your primary archetype. The secondary archetype, I could probably also map, that's, that's the thing you have to do with some effort, but you could do it if needed. Meaning you can play the role of the guy who does that if a guy with that primary archetype is not around. And it's great to see yourself as a primary archetype and a secondary archetype. What kind of man are you? Well, the primary archetype, oh, I do this. It's the easiest thing in the world. I don't even have to train to do it. And the other guys just say, what the fuck? How do you do that? Like, it's almost magical you can achieve that. That's your primary archetype. And if you find the primary and the secondary archetype, you can put that on the map and it makes sense that would in the tribe of 250 people 5,000 years ago, this would probably have been your contribution. The problem was we live in a very different society today. So we have to remap these archetypes and we cannot guarantee 
we can find an archetype for you that suits you today. We might have to modify these archetypes, and this is an ongoing research project. I don't think there's a single man anywhere in the world, not even the most experienced psychologist or the most experienced anthropologist who could easily map the kind of archetypes we need today. So this is the kind of research work that we do when we do men's work today, an ongoing research effort where all the brothers who come to our events have to be involved. And the first thing you do is, of course, you try to find your own primary and secondary archetype to then help brothers do the same thing. Yeah, it's primarily incredible. I see that people are pretty bad at seeing what they're supposed to be doing themselves or have often <laughs> slightly misguided ideas about it. And we're, we're far better when, when we really honestly, we're not just being like, you know, sweet and sympathetic, but when we honest and straight say, you know, when you do that, then that's when you're really contributing to the group. You know, I really feel supported by you. Um, and a lot of men will have, be really surprised, like, oh, well, you know, I do that, but that's just, you know, nothing or something like that. And um, and, and so that, that's what I, you know, having, creating these spaces where men are actually encouraging each other as opposed to like trying to push each other down and dominate. Uh, that's when we figure out like, oh, this is actually what I'm good at. This is what I can give. Because at the end of the day in men's work, then, you know, what we're trying to do is trying to help each other to lead and, and showing each other how to yeah. lift up because that's how the whole group gets lifted. Instead of me saying, oh, I need to be the boss here and I'm leading, uh, then, then we're all just fighting for that top position, right? So, uh, yeah, we have the three calls here. The first one is contribution. To be a man is to contribute. That's why your life as a man becomes meaningless and you have no purpose unless you find some kind of role where you contribute, especially towards your brothers. Then maybe you can contribute towards a woman and raise a family one day, but it's contribution towards your brothers and to society as a whole is absolutely fundamental. Many guys find that through the profession, but there's so many other ways you can find a contributive role. Contribution is number one. Contribution then leads to collaboration because then you discover that on your own, you can't do any contribution. You have to find your team. You find your other brothers, your gang your gang of brothers, a band of brothers that you contribute together with. So you can really shine in your specific contributive role. So that's collaboration. And collaboration is then an attitude that leads to the cooperation. And the cooperation can be towards society as a whole. We're all citizens of our society. We're also a lot of us family men, we raise kids, we, we marry and all those things. And that's when we, we go into cooperation role. And those three codes, if you put them together, you get the contribution, you get the collaboration, you get the cooperation. Then you've got the whole set of what it means to be a man. And you can be in flow. You can be in flow as often as you like when you find those keys. So I think in the original tribe, the way it was delivered to you was through the rite of passage. And what's important here is that you were dying to go through that ritual, right? To prove to the other guys you were a grown-up man. Finally, you were no longer a boy. You'd become a man. So you go through that manhood ritual and, and you then basically told that, yes, you passed the test. Yeah, I'm proud of you. Yeah. The next it wasn't thing easy, right? It was practice. painful and difficult. And, yeah, yeah. yeah. But the, yeah it, would, it would be a difficult test, right? But it would be test on a par with your capacity. Somebody would guide you through it that actually saw where you were heading in life, what kind of man you were about to become and gave you a test that suited you because then you get real self-confidence. It wasn't like you just barely survived. It was more like, no, I, I could even do this with ease, you know? But what's important after that is where the elderly come into the picture when it comes to the tribe. And the elders are the men who've lived a long life and they've seen everything and they're probably past 50 years old. They have no ego left. They just sit there with the wisdom and they love to give you advice to guide you properly. And what they would do is they would basically tell you, this is the kind of man we see in you. This is your potential as a man. So why don't you find a few brothers go out and test that over the next few years so we will then in return give you a mentor. The mentor is like an older uncle who steps into your life later in your life and compliments your dad. He, the, the first thing a mentor does is that he teaches you to love your father and respect your father and, and understand your father did whatever he could do. Mm -hmm. So you can come to terms with your father and put that aside and say, I had a great dad. He, did, he was human. He taught me how to be human. And without him, I wouldn't be here in the first place. So you can leave that aside and say, Father, you've done what you were supposed to do. Now you're going to mentorships. 
And the mentorships with men usually start between the years of when you're between 20 and 30 years old. It's usually when we do higher education. It's usually when we date women and decide whether we're going to get married and have children or not. All those really life-changing, important decisions that we make for ourselves as the kind of man we are, are made between 20 and 30. And in the tribe, this will be able to give you a mentor and say, this is a guy who's very similar to you. He's just older. Mm -hmm. He has an archetype that's similar to yours. That's why he will feel for you. He will adopt you. He will take you in and he basically says, I'm just here, available to you, to guide you to become the kind of man you're supposed to be so you can live a life with as much purpose as possible. And that's what we try to do in men's work as well. We try to develop these ideas better so that we can, one, put aside the father we grew up with and love him and honor him and our lineage that goes with that, and then look into what kind of man could I be? And then we start looking into the future. And the mentor is just the guide. He's just the, he's just the older man standing there saying that, come on in here. I believe this is where you should go. Now, find out for yourself whether this is the right path or not. And then find out for yourself what kind of path would that be today? Because the mentor will also tell you, life was very different 40 years ago when I walked this path. Now the whole environment is different. Technology is different. Uh, relationships are different. Values have changed. So you have to find your own path, your own version of the same path that becomes truly you. And that's what we do in this work. But I want to just underline as well the importance of those relationships across generations because, you know, I think yes. today we, a young guy who's 20 years old, he could just go online and he can find all the information out there, right? And he can read it and and so you can have this idea, and this is what I see a lot, is you know, millennials, they, they know everything. They have all the answers. They've read all the different gurus and spiritual literature and stuff like that. And they can often you know, educate me, but there's a wisdom that comes with age of knowing how to apply different sets of information in the right circumstance. And, and that comes from experience. Uh, and and you know, even my 12-year-old son, he's so sharp. He's so you know, really critical and... Uh, incredibly bright boy, but but he just lacks that that wisdom of experience, right? And and he's in a world today where, like in society, we're talking about you can just do everything yourself, and the whole world's possible. But we also see that a lot of boys are are crashing at some point because you know they they rush off in in some direction and then find. Yeah, that. you you just pointed that out. When the twelve year old believes he can do anything he wants in his life, it's a very effeminate fairy tale fantasy he's talking about, right? Oh, the, there's too much of a presence of the female body and too much of what you should have left behind already during your first year. It's still there, right? The problem is that with modern technology, especially with social media, say you're 19 years old, you only communicate with other 19 year olds. Mm -hmm. Well, you, you, you can communicate with thousands of 19 year olds, but none of them is older than 19. <laughs> none of them has a life experience that extends beyond 19 years old. Meaning all you can do in that environment is to find an abject to hate or something like that. You find, you find a common enemy that you can go after. That's what these guys usually do. Mm -hmm. And that gives you a sense of power. But that is not a proper purposeful life at all. That, that's not what it means to be a man at all. It's a very boyish little fantasy. It's actually very destructive and dangerous. So there is also this inherent need. And a lot of the guys around that we've met the last few years, you know, the guys who started following Jordan Peterson first, and then they contacted people like us, they, they, they were all about, wait a second, I'm 23, and I've got the other 23-year-olds around me. I know how they think, and they think like me, right? But as a group, we're even becoming dangerous because we need to look to older men. And this is the beauty. When you're 23, you're pretty high in yourself. Mm -hmm. And there's a reason for that narcissism. It is because you need to get out there in the world and you need to explore and find out what kind of man you are and to be able to do that and go through the hardship to, to reach that point where you said, this is the kind of man I am. You're going to have to be pretty self-preoccupied, right? But that doesn't serve the community as a whole. It only serves you and possibly a couple of brothers that are like-minded. Okay. If you're going to be a true contributor to society as a whole, if you're going to go from, you know, collaboration all the way also to cooperation, then you've got to find these older men who can guide you. And you will discover then that after they've turned 40, their egos are way smaller. And after they've turned 50, their egos are more or less gone because they're really tired of themselves. They, they've achieved what they set out to do when they get to that age. And they're way more interested in just guiding the younger men to the right place in life. And that's precisely why we have elders around. 
That's precisely what human beings live for three generations rather than two. We have the grandmothers, we have the grandfathers, we have these uncles and aunts, and, and we have the mentors. And they are usually a lot older even than our parents. And they're there to guide us to become the kind of men and women for that matter we're supposed to be. And the first thing they will kill is that fairy tale fantasy. You can be anything you want without effort. No, you can't. You can be a lot of things for sure, but it's gonna take a lot of effort to become those things. And to be able to fulfill those dreams and get your purpose in your life, you have to look at reality first and then look at yourself. And reality, that's all the other 8 billion people out there. That's the planet you live on today. We're all we're causing so much havoc against and we're almost destroying this planet. We need to save this planet to begin with. We need humanity to begin with. <laughs> you know, there's a lot of tough shit going on out there that's way more important than you are. And you have to look at that reality first. And then you can look back at yourself and say, this is the specific role that I could play. This is where I could find my contribution with my brothers, and that's how I get my purpose. And you need an older generation to guide you to that point. You're not going to find that advice from guys that are your own age or even younger. Yes, and I'll add that the older generation needs the younger generation as well, because the young guys, they have all of this energy and idealism and, and you know, just go out and get there. And, and so there's a, a beautiful- Well, that's why I have children to begin with, right? There has to be- <laughs> So yeah, exactly. to begin with, but the women birth the children, so they are therefore a fundamental part of our future at all times. That's precisely the, the, the greatest honor we can give to women as a collective, as men, is the fact that they give birth to children. That's absolutely fundamental. That also means the fundamental story is the one that everything returns to the same, meaning there's a to leave that space for somebody else to live. And, and that's what children are to begin with, and that, that's what childhood is. But then also after childhood, you have youth, and you have adolescence, and, and you have these guys who are not ready yet. They're, they're physiologically ready to be men. They can certainly reproduce themselves, God. Yeah, they're out there and they're horny and they start fucking around, right? But that also has to be contained. That, that whole containment and domestication of the sex drive I think is another fundamental aspect of religion. It's certainly something we work with when we do men's work. That's exactly why we have tantra teachers around. We have, we have teachers around to teach the guys to have a fulfilling sex life and not be frustrated about their sexuality. One of the things we point out very often the first night at our events is that a guy who hasn't sorted out his sex drive cannot be trusted because if he hasn't sorted out his sex life, he would be so obsessed with sorting that out that that would be his main preoccupation. So he cannot be trusted by the brothers. He doesn't even care about other brothers. He, he goes into a very narcissistic preoccupation with his own sexuality. So and I'd say but that, that's a, such a common thing that that's why the need for having these men's only events is so necessary because all of us to a certain extent have challenged with our sexuality. And so creating that kind of uh, sterile environment of now we're just guys and we're taking this game this constant cruising whatever it is that's happening uh with men and women together out of the equation yeah. then we can concentrate well yeah. who am i actually when i'm just standing face to face with other people honest and 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 vulnerable and direct and 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 trying to figure out who am i and and what am i actually doing here on this planet together with these other people yeah and we're not moralizing we're not some damn church ladies we're recognizing that you as a man, you're allowed to decide for yourself what are your values and how you're going to deal with the sexuality and where you're going to put your limitations. That's up to you to decide. But we're also stressing that we now live in a society where men and women are constantly together all the time. We're also emphasizing that we have a fashion industry that makes not only women but also men dress and behave at their sexually most attractive mode constantly, which puts them under enormous stress. We're also saying that we live in a society where we've got pornography now everywhere. We recognize this is precisely what mentors do. This is precisely the mentor's gaze. This is precisely the fatherly gaze, if you like, that first looks at reality. This is the kind of society we live in. We cannot escape from that. We have to recognize and, uh, and that first of all and realize that these are the things we're playing around with. Now, how much pornography are you going to consume knowing that? Okay, what does pornography do with you? How do you change and how are you affected by that? Are you aware of that? Because you should be. Okay, how do you deal with ma masturbation? How, how do you masturbate? When do you do that? What kind of role does that have in your life? When do you come? When do you not come? You can talk here, we get tantric teachers. They can advise you not to come all the time. They can have enormous benefits. 
You can put your liberty on your head. You can make amazing things in your life by not fucking. You can do these things too. So containing your sexuality, understanding how it works, and then containing it, and then maybe one day support other brothers in doing the same thing is fundamental spiritual work. Just like we talked about the forefather and the foremother as a fundamental religion and spirituality, another fundamental religion and spirituality is the containment of sexuality. Because the drive, the sex drive is libido. It, it's exactly the same drive that when you wake up in the morning, you want to have a cup of coffee, you want to live and start doing things and contribute and things like that. That is the same drive as your sex drive. So don't waste your sex drive on sex addiction. Don't waste your sex drive on constant jerking off to pornography. Rather, try to contain it and, and allow yourself, living in the contemporary society, allow yourself to enjoy it as well and forgive yourself when you overstepped and you couldn't contain yourself or whatever because it's not going to help you tomorrow by constantly moaning about what you did yesterday, but rather learn from the experiences you've had and decide for yourself what you're going to do tomorrow and try to stay with that. Yeah. And th this domestication, of sexuality, that the elders fostered on the younger in the tribe is something we need to return to. But now we have to make it an internal project because today we're all grown ups very early and, and we're told we're citizens and when we're 18 years old, we get a passport and we get to vote. And that means we cannot pretend that a 23 year old cannot decide for himself. No, a 23 year old can decide for himself what's best for him. But he has to first realize what kind of environment he's living in. How is the society different from the past? And what kind of advice would he need to make the right decisions. If you can contain that, if you can have a happy and a good sex life, then you can really start looking at amazing things in your life you can do together with your brothers. And yeah. the funny thing is, when we get the guys there, with the men's work, when we get the guys there, they stop talking about girls and they stop talking about sex. <laughs> yeah. They start talking about shit they want to build as soon as they get to that point. You can see the difference in the room right away. Yeah. Yeah. And I'd add for sure, like to, to, if, to really have a loving relationship with a woman, it's absolutely necessary to get a handle on, on that thing. You know, the moment you're, you're needy for sex all the time, then you're playing a game, which is actually involving manipulation and you're not having a truthful, honest relationship with another human being. And so, so being able yeah, to- and these, these days you got Tinder in your pocket. That means that if you're a sex addict, it's going to be pretty easy to find a girl who's a sex addict too. Yeah. And then you got two people that suffer from the same addiction problems in the same relationship. That's no different from having alcohol when you're an alcoholic and going out there and finding a girl who loves to have a drink too. Well, the two of you are going to probably sit on the park bench with no budget at all, and no time at all, drinking away every resource you have, right? Yeah. So the same problem you got with sex addiction. The fact that it's so easy to get what you want doesn't mean the addiction problem is, is any smaller. No, it's even bigger. So before you do that, you know, before you do that, try to contain your sexuality so that you master it. We call it mastering your sexuality. We have courses precisely that title our events. Yeah. Mastering your sexuality is fundamental. It's often early in men's work, often early in the weekend. So we try to do that so we can get that out of the way and then trust the other brothers around us that they either they master the sexuality or they're working on it. And that's precisely why I can do so many other amazing things together with yeah, and we realize that most guys are facing very, very similar challenges. And there's also just a relaxation yeah. of that brotherhood of being able to sit together and be like, okay, we're together here. And, 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 and the best thing to be doing is to really be lifting each other up. Uh, and, and uh, you know, I think most, a lot of guys say like, they go home from our events and they make love to their partner far better than they've ever done. Just yeah. also from all that testosterone that they've got from spending time with these other guys and uh, yeah, so. Yeah, and the one thing you do with libido when you get in your head, you become innovative, right? We are innovators, men are innovators. So for example, I'm heterosexual, I love women, I've had a girlfriend for 22 years, but she lives with women and I live with another man. And that works for us. It doesn't work for everybody. Probably only works for a small minority, but we meet a lot of people who, who see this kind of lifestyle that we're exploring here in Sweden and since it seems to work, 22 years is pretty good, right? Then, then uh, that's a lifestyle for certain men and certain women with certain archetypes that can be explored. And we're all for innovation, right? When we do men's work, we're all for innovation. When, when a guy walks into the room and said, I managed to do this, I managed to do that, I managed to do this, and suddenly I saw this way of living, started exploring it and it worked great okay then i'm sure there are other guys in the room who would love to share that story 
and would love to experiment with it and maybe take it even further. We're all for innovation. We're not judgmental in any way whatsoever. We, we know our own frustrations. We know it coming from the other brothers. We know exactly why guys are frustrated. We know why, why guys are frustrated with too much pornography consumption or they're frustrated with sex addiction, they're frustrated with drug and alcohol addictions. They're frustrated with not finding the right career. They're frustrated with failure. Frustrated with failing at, at, you know, at education, which probably means they pick the wrong archetype or they have the wrong motivation. Um, so, you know, we need to go back, step back and rethink who we are. And comparison, another one of these codes, comparison is a great thing. You compare yourself with other men, not to compete with them. You literally compare yourself with other men to find how you are similar to them and how you're different from them. So you can then make the best decisions for yourself. Yeah, and one of the central things at the European Men's Gathering is, is that we have a lot of teachers. I think we're up on 25 facilitators or something like that. I just booked Eli Buren to be coming as well, which is great. Um, Brilliant. But, but we don't agree with each other all the time. We have different perspectives. We have different you know, visions and ideas and, and values. And, and so, so we're not saying like, this is how you're going to be a man. But it's more that's emergent in every small sharing group and, and through the workshops. Then that comes out like, oh, this is how I'm supposed to be a man. And there's many different men to reflect in and be mirrored by. And uh, so, so we can, it's, a, it's a shared exploration, right? Where it's not just Absolutely. someone lecturing you, this is what we have to do kind of thing. Yeah, we, we got guys walking through the door and there's sort of science freaks and militant atheists. And mm -hmm. the next guy walks through the door is deeply religious and he's found a spiritual path that is very important to him. Uh, I would say we're all spiritual in a sense, but whether you believe in God or not is totally irrelevant. Mm -hmm. We are interested in you as a man and as a brother uh, working on yourself to become the man that you want to be. And, 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 and then once you found that spot, starting contributing to your brothers and, or sharing that growth uh, together with other men, being on the path together with your brother, especially guys of your own age and being on the path together, supporting uh, in that process. And, and we recommend all the guys who come to our events that if they don't have a men's group locally where they live already, we give them the tools so they can start one themselves because we believe having that local community of brothers is absolutely essential. Not online, not through social media, yeah. not other brothers living on the other side of the planet that you talk to online, but really having physically present brothers in your own neighborhood, in the town where you live, who you meet on a regular basis to get support from. Yes. Absolutely fundamental. So, so this is exactly why it's a distributed, distributed network. It's just like um, everything we do is about you take these tools with you, you come home and you even sharpen those tools in the process and come back the next year and tell us how you innovated. Oh, oh, I, I, I sharpened this tool even better. We, if you do this rather than that, it's easier or less costly or whatever. So it's a continuous effort, a continuous collective effort from all of us to make men's work happen. Absolutely fantastic. Uh, I think, Alexander, I'm, I'm really looking forward even more now to uh, September until we're yeah, me too. gathering together. Yeah, can uh, I just uh, point out one thing about the European men's gathering when I find it so important? Okay. Yeah. I go to a lot of these events around Europe. Eli Buren, you just named him. He, he's coming this year. We had Arne Rubenstein last year at the EMG. Why I found the European men's gathering especially important is that this is the first event I've seen in Europe that actually tries to reach the next level. That meaning we're not really reaching out to the guys who on a fundamental basic level try to sort their shit out. We have a lot of brothers out there suffering a lot. We welcome them too. But this event is more and more, the European Men's Gathering has become more and more about leadership. So it's more and more about guys who are already men's in men's work locally. So say you've got a community where you live, you've got your own men's group, you've taken on a leadership role, you started growing in that leadership role, you even become an innovator, you've experimented and found out great solutions that you would love to share with your brothers. In that case, the EMG is the perfect event to go to because this is probably the first event in Europe that has already moved on to a leadership level when it comes to men's work. So we're somewhere in between taking care of the basic stuff, especially the younger guys who come to our events. And we certainly... You, you know, if you're 19 years old and you just started your journey, you maybe only discovered a few months ago that you, you were interested in men's work and this was probably going to be an important part of your life, then you're more than welcome to join us. But the event already is a lot about the 50-year-olds talking to the 30-year-olds on, on, you know, the problems you have with the next generation. So what was timeless when it comes to men's work and what is more specific to the times we live in. And these discussions that also involve politics and spirituality and men-women relationships and society as a whole, these discussions are also ongoing in our events. So for me, 
it's absolutely essential for me to go to the Urban Men's Gathering every year because this is the one event where I can also develop myself as a men's work leader and teacher. So I, I want to emphasize that. And I, I think that's why it's important that it's a four day event. Uh, it doesn't cost a single penny more than it has to. It, it's just cost coverage we're talking about, but the four day event and housing and food and everything means you got a pay ticket that's relevant to that. But it's still nothing compared to any businessman's hotel stay or whatever you like out there. And the learning experience you go through, the, the sharing experience you go through these four days is incredible. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think uh, just I, I, I think we had I had some guys from last year who said, you know, I, they've gone to these leadership trainings that have cost, you know, 20 times more. And, and the value that they got out from from this kind of embodied approach to learning how to lead, how to guide, how to lead oneself uh, is, is absolutely invaluable. And I think that's what we've seen with European Men's Gathering is yeah, we're yeah. really creating yeah. a space we, where we, we, everybody can contribute. Everybody can have their voice heard. Uh, so it's not uh, yeah about. Just and it's not a mechanical event. It, it's, it's not. It's just, it can be very, very efficient for you to lock yourself up some day, get somewhere for three or four days, and, and have somebody just basically force feed you knowledge or information. That's not the kind of event we're talking about here. The European Men's Gathering is a listening event, very much. We're taking in the information. Uh, dare I say, we also have the aspect of strong female leadership that we do take in the information and the knowledge from everybody who attends the event. But we do put a focus on, on the most learned and the most experienced. And that's precisely because it is an event where even leaders and teachers can go and grow. That's, that's what makes the European Men's Gathering stand out. And that's precisely why it's carrying that prefix European. Great. Well, thank you very much, Alexander, for sharing. And um, I'm going to put a thank little code at the bottom of this video, also with a little discount code for people who signed up if they've managed to get all the way to the end here. Great. Brilliant. Thanks for having me here today, Paul, and for doing the brilliant editing afterwards. That's your effort here. <laughs> and besides, you know, putting some excellent questions forward and, and sharing your ideas with me. I really love this conversation. I think just it's just European men's gathering quality. That's what yes. we're going for. Big time. See okay. you in September, guys. Yep. Yeah. See you, Paul, probably next week. Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs>